Good morning, everybody. That was Sarah Ann Davison right there. Welcome back, Sarah. Thanks. Welcome back you, you, to you. Thank you. Well, we haven't seen, seen each other. We haven't seen each other in a month of Sundays. You. I'm, uh, we missed you. And None of these other guys, though. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you've been skiing and Went skiing. traveling. Listen, hit those slopes, honey. Bunny slopes, at least. You, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> if, if this is not a miniature guitar that she's playing over here, even though it looks like one. It's actually a specialized guitar built by Chris Alvarado, and if you're watching Kevin Simonson, this is your this is Kevin Simonson's guitar, uh, but Sarah, because she's been skiing and uh, jet setting all over the world, doesn't know where her guitar is, so she's playing this one over here. Well, right. I know where it is. Oh, do you? Yes. It's just not here. It's just not here, <laughs> <laughs> which is typical for me. <laughs>
not how we rehearsed it. Sorry about that. But it was good. You stuck with it. <coughs> so <coughs> this is a great old, uh, it's not bluegrass song, but it can be close. It's an old country gospel song that uh, Nick suggested that we sing today, and then Nick's not here because Nick is not feeling well today. Nick's been moving. If you didn't know, you should go out on Facebook and look at Nick's new haircut, though. Man, like he's back in the army or something. He looks great. Have you seen it, Sarah? I haven't. Oh, it's he's high and tight and took ten years oh, off. I of, love t- it. T- ten years off of his uh, look, and he <laughs> looks great. But I think it's like Samson. He cut his hair and he lost his strength. Um, <laughs> so he's been he's been moving and and uh, he's just worn out today. So I told him to take care of himself. I certainly understand that. But this old uh, gospel song that he picked is called uh, "On the Wings of a Snow White Dove." What key are we doing this in? Is Sarah singing this? I think I'm singing it. I think okay. we're doing it in G, right? We'll give it a little Let's harmony. See. You know, what? Nick sent the song to me, and he was like, do you know this song? And I was like, are you kidding me? This song was in our little uh, redback hymnal in the Baptist church that I grew up in. I love it. Oh, this is a great song. <laughs> All right, let's give it a go here. <laughs>
Annabelle Four has our reading from Ruth chapter 4 today. Take it away, Anna. The run-up to the beginning of today's reading is that Boaz, the owner of the field that Ruth was gathering corn in, had done a legal exchange. Sealed, not as we would, with a pen and paper, a notary or a lawyer present, but with a sandal, a shoe was given, witnessed by the community, as was the custom when making a deal. Let's read what the deal was in Ruth chapter 4. Then Boaz said to the elders and to the crowd standing around, You are all witnesses that today I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian and Malan. And with the land I have acquired Ruth, the Moabite widow of Malan, to be my wife. This way she can have a son to carry on the family name of her dead husband and to inherit the family property here in his hometown. You're all witnesses today. Then the elders and all the people standing in the gate replied, we are witnesses. 
May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, from whom all the nation of Israel descended. May you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. And may the Lord give you descendants by this young woman, who will be like those of our ancestor Perez, the son of Tamar and Judah. So Boaz took Ruth into his home and she became his wife. Peace of the Lord be with us all today. My friend Michael Frost, in addition to having what I think is the greatest beard on the continent of Australia, has been a pastor and church planner, author, university professor for the last 30 years, and I love and appreciate his work so much. He told a few, a few years ago, he told a story about attending a church somewhere down under, I think it was in Sydney, and it was a regal, almost cathedral-like setting. The church was old and stayed beautiful in its construction formal in its liturgy, flying buttresses and 
pipe organs, the choir in the loft, and the young minister in charge, and in his vestments and robe, rose to the pulpit. But on this day, the sanctuary was all but desecrated. Up front, before the altar, and in front of the kneeling rail was an unloaded dumpster of garbage, or at least it appeared to be an entire dumpster of garbage. The choir came out, musicians and readers, and as I said, the pastor took the platform, oblivious it seemed to this disgusting heap of trash in the middle of the church. Attendees and worshipers arrived, they were scandalized. What is this? What is going on? Were the spoken and unspoken questions. People began to move away from their usual seats to the back of the church, to the balcony. The smell was too much. Some people left entirely and all along the service proceeded as if nothing was amiss. The choir sang, the liturgy readers read, the pastor made his usual announcements, and then the time for communion and homily arrived. The pastor, in front of everyone, tore away his ecclesiastical robe and laid it aside. And beneath, he was wearing an old t-shirt, cut off dungarees, muck boots. He grabbed the holy elements, the bread and the cup. He stepped down from the platform and went wading through this waste and waste deep mess, holding the sacraments high above so as not to pollute them. He arrived on the other side of the garbage, closer to the congregation, now filthy himself, and he gave an invitation to the congregants, who, if they weren't bamboozled yet, certainly were by now. He said, if you will take of our Lord's life, his blood and his body, you must walk through the garbage of this world to receive it. And then standing there in those short pants and smelling like a dumpster, he gave his homily for the day. He talked about the beauty <coughs> of the church and the building, the sacredness of that space. He spoke about Holy Communion, its symbolism, its power, its life-giving and communal qualities. And he talked about the community that surrounded that beautiful building. The brokenness, the death, the stench just steps away from the body and blood of Christ. And he challenged those people who gathered there that day like they had never been challenged before to open their eyes and to see their community for what it was. A messy place. Sometimes a dangerous place. Always a place where trash and people were easily discarded. And he concluded it all by saying, that if we are not willing to walk through the garbage, if we aren't willing to get dirty and to step into the trash, then we're not ready to receive the life that God has for us. Michael didn't disclose what happened to that young pastor. I'm not so sure he could have survived, ministerially speaking, that single unorthodox Sunday. I like to think that maybe he did, but regardless what he said <coughs> and what he so boldly illustrated that day was the absolute truth, whether those in attendance heard it or not. This world is messy. Human relationships are messy. Life can be a garbage heap. People by nature, by whatever fly there is in the ointment, tend to create chaos. You don't have to con condemn it since it appears to be our natural position, but you have to accept it. You have to acknowledge it and admit it. Thus, anything that is good or holy or life-giving or redemptive or salvific has to come in contact with what is messy and stinky and repulsive and dirty, whatever we might think of as sinful. That young pastor was right. When you pick up that bread, when you drink of that cup, when you come to the table of our Lord and you take those elements <coughs> into your body, you are remembering the death of Jesus. But you are also recognizing that His death was the result of God's perfect love taking on human flesh. A fallible, fallen world will always try to crucify and kill perfect love. 
What is dark will always try to snuff out what is bright and good. But perfect love and goodness cannot be destroyed. It is always resurrected. And when we come to the table, we participate in that resurrection. And we go out to live in the world that just can't seem to help itself or get out of its own way. And that is my introduction to Ruth 4. What a tremendous journey this little book has turned out to be. We meet Naomi and Ruth way back in chapter 1 in the throes of tragedy. They both are widowed. Their husbands have died. And for Naomi, it is doubly worse, triple even. Ruth's loss is hers as well. Ruth's husband was her son, and she lost her other son as well. She has buried all the men in her life. But Ruth stays with her. They make this journey of hope back to Bethlehem, back home for Naomi, (coughs) and into this strange, foreign, unknown world for Ruth. But they are journeying, at least. They are moving. Tragedy doesn't have to have the final word. Their story is still being told. There is still hope. Hope is still being carried in their hearts. I left you waiting and hoping, I hope, Last Sunday, Naomi has launched an audacious plan. She is sending Ruth, her widowed daughter-in-law, with a marriage proposal to Boaz. Ruth is a vulnerable, at-risk woman in a chauvinistic, misogynistic society. Boaz is a relative of her former father-in-law who has died. As such, Boaz is in position to protect Ruth and Naomi to take them in, but he has to marry Ruth for that to happen. Naomi is making her bet that he will do exactly that. She sends Ruth to him. His responsibility placed squarely upon his shoulders and he accepts it as the kinsman redeemer. And we're waiting to see if the audacious plan works. All the chips pushed to the center of the table And you've heard the outcome today with the scripture reading. Boaz, God loved that man, is as good as his word. He goes down to the city gate where all the elders and city leaders hung out drinking their coffee and gossiping. And yes, conducting business. And yes, holding court. And Boaz strikes the business deal as it appears for the land. And he makes the deal in court for the marriage. All of this praying and hoping and working and dreaming and scheming of Naomi and Ruth, they see their plan work its way to fruition. Boaz says, you are all witnesses that today I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech and with the land I take Ruth, the Moabite widow of Milan, to be my wife. Now let's get back to where the holy and the good collide with the messy world. I'm going somewhere, so stay with me. Go with me. The elders affirm Boaz and his marriage. Even though he is marrying a foreign woman woman of their sworn enemy. That's no little thing for a small town or a small town's brain trust to get over. And if you grew up in a small town, you know this. And in their affirmation, they mention five people by name. They mention five people from their own history. Five people who are their direct ancestors. Who lived right there in and around Bethlehem. These are five people with a sordid, messy, dumpster fire history. But who in spite of that, found a way to walk through the garbage and the refuse and the stench of it all. And they found good on the other side. Hope on the other side. Disaster crashed headlong into redemption. So let me tell you their stories this morning. I begin at verse 11. The elders and all the people standing in the gate replied, We are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah from whom all the nation of Israel descended. (coughs) 
who were Rachel and Leah. You might remember their names from a series months ago that I gave on the life of Joseph. These two women were sisters, the wives of Jacob, who would later become known as Israel, the namesake of the nation. Jacob swindled his twin brother (coughs) out of the family inheritance. And after doing so, he had to run for his life because his brother was going to kill him for it. Jacob crosses town and country, escapes to a faraway land, and lives with a man named Laban. Laban is his uncle, his mother's brother. And there he finds safety, and there he finds sanctuary, and yes, there he finds love. He falls in love with Rachel. But Rachel is his cousin. And I know the jokes write themselves, especially for those of us in the South. Rachel is his cousin, but he is in love with her. And he proposes, not to her, but to Laban, her father, and wants to take her hand in marriage. And Uncle Laban says, well, that's all well and good, but you're a young man on the run, and you don't have any dowry to offer. You have no land. You have no home of your own. You'll have to work for her. Seven years. Tend my farm. Tend these goats, these sheep. Work for me for seven years, and Rachel is yours. So, Jacob worked for seven years to acquire Rachel. Not many young men would have taken that deal, but he did. The years pass, and it felt like only a few days, Jacob would admit later, because he loves her so much, and eventually the wedding feast is thrown. The family celebrates, and the newlywed couple are married, and they consummate their marriage, but on the morning following the wedding When the veil comes off and the burqa that the ancient Hebrew women would have worn in that day is removed, it is not Rachel in Jacob's bed, it is her older sister Leah. And for seven years, Jacob has been working only to be given the wrong wife. He is furious. He goes into his uncle's tent, his uncle's house, and he demands justice for this crime. To which Laban just smiles and says, Jake, around here we don't marry off the youngest daughter first. The oldest is married first. You have Leah. And if you'll work seven more years, then you can have Rachel. Jacob works seven more years. And at the end of 14, he finally has Rachel, but he also has Leah, and it is not happily ever after. Far from it. It is a disaster. This family becomes nothing but a cauldron of competition, betrayals, murderous jealousy. Jacob and his wives don't appear to have a minute of peace for the rest of their lives. May she be like Rachel and like Leah? What are the elders of Bethlehem even asking for here? Well, without these two women... As auspicious a start as they had, there would not have been the nation of Israel. These two sisters produce the twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve sons of Jacob. A future was born out of that disastrous combo marriage. Good, colliding with the messy. And quickly to the other ancestors they invoke, Perez the son of Tamar and Judah. Please run the young children away from your computer screen or your television or your mobile device, wherever you are watching this. Because this is an NC-17 rated tale to tale. It is not a bedtime Bible story. It is found in, in, excuse me, in Genesis 38. Judah, Jacob's son with Leah, grows into a man. He marries. He has three sons of his own. And in time, Judah arranged a marriage for his oldest boy, a never-do-gooder named Ur, E-R. His new wife was a woman called Tamar. The Bible says that following the wedding, Ur was so wicked that God took his life. 
The ancient custom of the kinsman redeemer was already in place. So the next brother (coughs) in birth order was to marry her, impregnate her to perpetuate the family name. That brother, Onan, more or less complied, but he too was a man of bad character. And the Bible says God took his life as well before Tamar is with child. This leaves Judah with one son. His youngest named Shelah. Judah promises Tamar that when the boy is old enough to marry, Shelah would fulfill the ancient custom and become her husband. Remember, for a Middle Eastern woman living in ancient days, there is no greater shame or greater economic vulnerability than to be left without a husband or an heir. Such was this woman, left without recourse, left without justice. It is a big deal here because Judah turns out to be a liar. He will not give Shelah to Tamar as her husband. He's already lost two sons to this woman. He sees her as somehow cursed, not recognizing that he has raised stupid children. He sees her as cursed, and he will not lose his last and only son to her. Well, she's not completely powerless. She's an enterprising woman. One day she goes out, On the wayside where the shepherds will pass, she dresses herself as a prostitute. And she waits for Judah to come by, her father-in-law. Judah comes by, she entices him into her bed. When the transaction is complete, she says, how are you going to pay for this? He takes his corded necklace off, his seal, his walking stick. Items that were as personalized as a social security number or a driver's license identity in that day. And he gives them to Tamar and he says, I'll be back and this is my pledge that I will pay you. And he goes home. Well, months later, Tamar begins to show she's pregnant with twins. And the neighbors come to Judah. Judah, your daughter-in-law has prostituted herself. She's pregnant with some man's child. And Judah is furious. And he gathers up the family and the neighbors. And he goes to Tamar where he will summarily stone her to death by custom and burn her body. Because that's what we do to prostitutes and harlots. (laughs) And just as they're about to carry out the sentence... She speaks up at the last minute and she says, I can tell you who the father is if y'all would like to know. I have his cord and his seal and his walking stick. And Judah says, let's see it. That man is guilty too. And she produces his very identity in front of the entire world. And Judah is shamed. Judah is made out to be the fornicator and the liar That he is. And he has to call Tamar righteous. Righteous. Even though she was unorthodox. In how she sought justice. And people this is a mess. This is a tire fire. This is a tangled ball of twine. That you would never straighten out. But Judah chastised by this trash heap that he has created takes Tamar and those precious boys into his own home and raises them as favored sons. They replace the sons he had lost. And the entire heritage and ancestry of Israel falls down on the oldest of those twins, the firstborn, a little baby named Perez, who would become the great great-grandfather of Boaz himself. What I'm saying is that without this sordid mess, Boaz himself wouldn't even exist. I'm thinking of a man right now named William. He and his family lived on the same little farm for decades and decades. He farmed the land that his father farmed 
who farmed the land that his father farmed. He had a beautiful Irish wife. Her name was Rebecca. She was pregnant with their second child, and I'm not sure what happened. I haven't been able to determine what kind of trouble he got into, but it was bad. He took Rebecca, eight months pregnant, and his little two-year-old boy, and every penny he could scrape together, and he jumped on a ship out of Belfast. The baby in that womb of Rebecca could not wait, would not wait. He was born somewhere in the North Atlantic in the summer of 1734. Samuel McBrayer was his name, the second son of William and Rebecca McBrayer of Kelele, Northern Ireland. And a few summers ago, I stood over Samuel McBrayer's grave just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. And without whatever mess it was that blew his father and mother across the sea, I wouldn't be standing here today. I wouldn't be in existence today without whatever trouble he had. I'm thinking of Adam Cupper. Adam was 16 years old and started walking. Walking away from Stuttgart, Germany. Walking away from whatever trouble he was in. Walking away from his family. Completely alone. Walking away from an economic recession and a war. He walked out of Germany. He walked all the way across France. He walked all the way to the English Channel. And in the port of La Evoe, France, he climbed aboard a ship called the Zurich. And weeks later, he landed at Castle Garden, New York. Processed his papers. Took a ferry across the Hudson River to Jersey City, New Jersey, and the boy finally stopped walking three blocks inland and hardly traveled anywhere the rest of his life. He had walked nearly 700 miles. He had sailed nearly 4,000 miles. And the younger, and he was younger then than my youngest son is now. And in 1852, Adam Cupper, who would change his last name to the more English-sounding Cooper, would start a new life And neither my wife nor that youngest son of mine would exist without that 17-year-old kid who made it alone all the way across the world. I'm thinking of another young man, not yet 30, who thinks today that he has so irresponsibly screwed up his life that he will never recover. That is not true. Hope will carry him through the mess that he has made and his story will still be told. I'm thinking of a 40-something-year-old divorcee. She gave her whole self, her whole life, her whole being to a marriage, to a family, and she wanted it to be forever, but it is not. It burned down in front of her and all around her, but her story is still being told, and that disaster somewhere will collide with redemption along the way. Don't lose hope. I'm thinking of that old man who should have spent more time with his kids, and he knows it. Who should have spent less time at work, and he knows it. Who wishes he could go back and undo the years, but he can't, and he knows it. Brother, if you are still breathing, and you can still hear me, there is still time and space for your story to find new meaning. And if it doesn't in your lifetime, if you die before you see it, your story will still be told. And it just might transcend the garbage that you think will never unstick from you. Do you really think that Boaz, on the day he declared his allegiance to a foreign woman, standing outside those ancient gates, thought that he, we would be talking about him today? Of course not. Do you think Leah and Rachel, angry, competitive, and heartbroken, crying themselves to sleep most every night for years, thought those boys they were having would change the world? Of course not. Did William McBrayer imagine his descendants would be speaking about him, honoring him, 300 years after the fact, no, he was just trying to survive. Could a 16, 17-year-old German stowaway on a Swiss ship 
in a French harbor, traveling to an American city, know about all the beautiful and magnificent children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren who would follow him? No. And neither do you. This life may not always give you what you want. But keep the faith. Hold on to hope. You might find that with a little work and a little waiting and a lot of wonder, it will give you what you need. And that is my prayer for you, for all of us. And it's in Christ's name I ask this. Reception, glass of wine in her hand. I knew she would meet her connection. At her feet was a footloose man. No, you can't always get what you want. Take a verse right here. I'll help you out. 